Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, May 16th, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight. Nuns use a higher power to take on Obamacare. After that, Texas pulls gold from the Fed to make it non-confiscatable. And finally, long lines are the residue of the TSA's cries for more money. And what could possibly ease the pain of passengers who wait so long that they have to sleep on cots? Clowns. And I'm dead serious. Well, then everyone loses their minds. That's next. Well, today there was an interesting story from The Mirror in the UK about how a former American who's now living in Thailand is proposing to reproduce the 9-11 attacks and settle the question once and for all, he says. Now, he's saying he needs to raise a million pounds. I guess my first question is, does that only cost the CIA? <laughs> he says he's going to buy a building that is going to be torn down, and then he's going to crash a 747 Boeing into it at 500 miles per hour. Well, first of all, let's make sure that it actually is able to fly that fast. But he says this is going to be an important project to prove that conspiracy theories once and for all, whether they're true or not. Okay, listen, the only way that this is going to work and disprove the theories is if you fly it into the building or two, and another building that doesn't have anything at all flown into it collapses in its footprint. And I guess when we look at all of this, you remember it was two planes, but three buildings that fell down. Building seven was never hit by a plane. It just had some debris that fell off. There was a minor fire. We had firefighters who have testified then, and now that they heard major explosions going off, we have uh, Silverstein saying, pull it down. And of course, it did look like a demolition, didn't it? Isn't that interesting? Now, he says he's going to purchase a building that's about to be torn down in the countryside. So the first thing that's going to happen is that people who want to believe this absurd story, this absurd conspiracy theory from the government, are going to say, well, it's not the same kind of construction. That's the first thing we're going to hear, and it probably won't be. Nevertheless, we need to real remember that there have never been any lawsuits against this. And U.S. buildings, uh, especially the steel skyscrapers, were supposedly designed to withstand a plane hit, a direct hit, ever since the Empire State Building was hit by a plane, many, many decades before this ever happened. And of course, there have never been any modifications to the procedures for how firefighters are supposed to fight fires in skyscrapers. We've never seen this happen with any other skyscrapers. I don't know why he thinks it's going to happen with this one. It certainly will be entertaining theater, but as we pointed out when we interviewed Tony Rook and he had a firefighter who went to the mat, resigned his job over this issue. Tony Rook is a filmmaker in the UK, wrote a documentary called Incontrovertible. No changes have been made to the architectural plans, to the design requirements. No lawsuits have been filed because they didn't follow the uh, plans and no changes have been made to the way they fight fires and skyscrapers. He says he's going to discover whether there are similar physics which cause the Twin Towers to collapse. Okay, maybe you're gonna to have to get Marvin Bush to work there a little while before they fly the plane into the building, who knows. <laughs> now, on more serious news, we've got a former MIC head saying that Europe faces a populist uprising over the migrant crisis. This is Richard Dearlove, formerly the head of the MI6. He says that if Europe cannot act together to persuade a significant majority of its citizens that it can gain control of its migratory crisis, then the EU will find itself at the mercy of a populist uprising, which is already stirring. He added that next month's vote on the UK leaving the European Union was, quote, the first roll of the dice in a bigger geopolitical game. And of course, certainly it is. I talked about this earlier today on the radio show in the fourth hour, the issues that are before the British people. And Boris Johnson has made it very clear. He went through and he talked about eight different reasons for the British to leave the European Union. And we parallel that as to reasons why Texas should leave the United States. They point out top security experts in Germany told Ch Chancellor Angela Merkel last October that the middle class in Germany was becoming radicalized as a result of her open borders migrant policy and that they might have domestic disorder in Germany as well. You know, earlier today on the fourth hour, I talked about Boris Johnson 
the former mayor of London who favors Britain leaving the European Union, he laid out eight reasons why Britain would be better off outside of the EU. And I thought it was very interesting because every one of those reasons had a much deeper parallel with Texas leaving the federal union that we have here. I said, you know, we ought to have, instead of just a Brexit, we ought to have an exit as well. But there are many European nations that would like to have a referendum as to whether or not they would stay in the European Union or whether they would leave. It hasn't taken very long for the European Union to become very dictatorial, very controlling, very regulatory of everything that is happening there. A lot of people are not happy with what has happened there. That's happened in just a couple of decades, what it took America to do in a couple of centuries. But of course, there are reasons for all of us to want to have a much closer, much more local government. This is one reason. The story today about the Supreme Court uh, ruling on Obamacare care's mandate for nuns to purchase insurance for birth control. Now, how ridiculous is that? And of course, the Supreme Court has essentially punted on the issue. The Little Sisters of the Poor is a 175-year-old religious order that ministers to the elderly and provides for their needs. The Obamacare mandate that non-church religious groups must provide contraceptive and abortion-inducing drugs at no cost to their employees went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court has now sent it back to a lower court. Here's the issue. As we pointed out before, they kicked the idea back and forth, saying that, well, it would be unconstitutional if it were a mandate, but it's a tax, so it is constitutional. No, it's not. If it's a tax, they need to have an amendment like they did for the income tax. And I understand the people who have an issue with the way the amendment was passed just ignore that for the second and say they acknowledged that they needed to have an amendment to have an income tax, which means that they need to have an amendment to have any other direct taxes. They acknowledged that they needed to have an amendment to prohibit alcohol, which means that if they want to prohibit marijuana, where is the amendment to prohibit alcohol, uh, to prohibit marijuana? And yet they continue to do this. And so what they do is they pull this up and they even say, is this a conflict with the congressional law, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act? No, it's a conflict with the First Amendment, which says Congress shall make no law, including Obamacare, that will take away religious freedom, the uh, freedom to practice our religion freely. So this is a situation where the Supreme Court has overstepped its legal abilities to rule on this, and now they're pushing it back to lower courts. It just continues to go, and it's yet another reason why we need to push the idea of Texas. Texas getting out, maybe some other states will want to have a referendum as to whether or not they would leave as well. And of course, there was this article today, an update on Texas's uh, move to have a gold depository here in the state. Remember, we reported on this about a year ago. It was June 15th last year. We had an article on Infowars.com from Zero Hedge. The writing is on the wall. Texas pulls a billion dollars in gold from the New York Fed and makes it non-confiscatable. They said the lack of faith and central bank trustworthiness is spreading. And of course, again, we see this not only here in America, not only in Texas, but we see it happening first in Europe. They say first in Germany, then in Holland, then in Austria. They all wanted to get their gold back from the United States depositories. And of course, what did the depositories tell them, these trustworthy depositories? We'll have to think about it. Uh, we'll get it back to you maybe two years from now. We'll give you some of that back. We're not sure. So now Texas, that was a year ago, enacted a bill to repatriate a billion dollars of gold from the New York Fed's vaults to the newly established state gold bullion depository, and it included a section that would prevent forced seizure from the federal government. At the time, Texas Governor Greg Abbott signed the bill into law as June 12th. It allowed Texans to build a gold and silver depository, a, a bullion depository, and they said at the time there were two reasons for them to do this. One involved distrust in the current storage system. The other was the threat of the paper money system as a whole. And I would say there was also a third issue, and that is the dishonest, morally, and financially bankrupt federal government and the private Federal Reserve. And at the time, it was interesting because we had a New York lawyer immediately come out and write an op-ed piece attacking the idea that Texas would, be, would have such an effrontery that they would not trust the Federal Reserve or the federal government. This is New York attorney Joe Patrice, who wrote a blog in Above the Law. He condemned Texas's creation of a gold bank. He said, you may be wondering why any state would want to build a gold repository when the federal government already provides one that's so secure, so large, that most American allies keep their reserves there as well, ignoring what I just told you, the fact that we have many 
American allies who want to get their gold back, and they're very concerned that it's not forthcoming. They're very concerned about whether or not it's still there. He says it quickly becomes apparent in this article that we had a, a year ago that the lawyer was mad that anyone would do anything that, to suggest uh, that we should not have less, that we should have less than 100% faith in anything that the government does. But they point out at the time, even Mother Jones admitted that Texas pays more in taxes than it gets. And I mentioned this today earlier. You know, when Boris Johnson was giving his eight reasons for Britain to leave the EU, he said, hey, they would give us 350 million pounds per week, which is about a half a million dollars per week for Britons to spend as Britons saw fit. Well, guess what it is with Texas? We send three times that amount of money to the, to the federal government, and that's the net, the difference between what they send to Texas and what we send to them. One and a half billion dollars per week. What are we getting for it? Nothing but continual meddling. And so when they won't leave us alone, we ought to leave them. And it's akin to this type of pushback that we see from this New York lawyer when he says, we hate those secessionists, we'll never allow them to leave, we demand that they be united to us forever. And so now what we saw this last weekend was not only a move to push for Texas secession that came within two votes of going before the floor of the 4,000 people on the floor to vote for it, but now we've seen a company here in Texas propose to set up a depository and do it without taxpayer money, Texas style. That's a great idea. How does your government serve you? Well, of course, there's probably no better example of how broken government can be than the TSA, surpassing now even the Department of Motor Vehicles. And in the next segment, we're going to have Jakari Jackson talk to one of our staff members here, Alejandra Gutierrez, about her personal experiences last week. And of course, I've had similar experiences the last time I flew. It was, it was very early in the morning. We were taking out uh, uh, a flight first thing in the morning. There's a lot of business flyers there, but not very many people. And only a third of the lanes were open, and all the people were standing around there in line. Nothing was moving. Even the lane that was open was not taking anybody through the uh, procedures. And everybody was saying, what are they doing? They were just standing around talking to each other. But of course, if it's happening where you are, it's not their problem. It's your problem. And they'll find ways to deal with it. You know, here's one of the articles that was on the Drudge Report today. TSA lines causing frowns, then send in the clowns. You know, I immediately thought of the Stephen Sondheim song, you know, isn't it rich, aren't we a pair? Me here on the ground and you in the air, because I'm waiting on the TSA. Okay, send in the clowns, don't bother, they're here. They're wearing blue shirts and gloves. And they've also got tiny horses. They are entertaining people with tiny horses, bringing them into the airport to try to keep them from getting irate. Uh, next, I guess we'll have some rainbow unicorns that they can parade in front of us. This is the silliness of this, okay? It is security theater, and now they're going to turn it into security dinner theater just to entertain us instead of fixing the problem. Maybe they could read a play from Kafka talking about an unresponsive bureaucracy. But you understand where this is all headed, don't you? It is not just gridlock at the airports. They want to gridlock our transportation system. They'll probably bring out the Viper teams on the roads at some point and make that so obnoxious that people will feel like it's a relief when they impose a complete control grid using electronics and auto driving cars and the black boxes that they're about to mandate into our cars. At that point, people will say, gee, this is much better than when we had to stop and uh, get out and get searched by these Viper teams. It's an absolute shame that we have something like this. And we warned you about this at InfoWars a couple of years ago. Before we go to this interview uh, with Jakari and Ali, I want to remember that two and a half years ago, October 2013, we had the blogger who has uh, been on the TSA for quite a bit, John Corbett, sued them because he had proven that their machines were ineffective. And as part of the lawsuit discovery, he was able to get some documents from the TSA. And now they always post the lawsuits on pacer.gov. And unfortunately, they posted the unredacted lawsuit. And so you can see there that redacted uh, item that they put up. This is what they didn't want you to hear. Remember, this is the TSA. It's not me. It's not somebody who dislikes what the TSA is doing. The TSA said this and then redacted it, but then unfortunately they put up the unredacted version in their incompetency. This begs the question, says the TSA, of what 
evidence the government possesses to rationalize that we should be so afraid of non-metallic explosives being brought aboard flights departing from the U.S. that we must sacrifice our civil liberties. The answer, says the TSA, this, I'm reading, quoting the TSA, this is redacted, this is what they try to redact. The answer, there is no reason to sacrifice our civil liberties. As of mid-2011, terrorist threat groups present in the homeland are not known to be actively plotting against civil aviation targets or airports. Instead, their focus is on fundraising, recruiting, and propagandizing. Okay, who's propagandizing who here? It's the TSA. I just read to you what the TSA wrote in 2011, then redacted. And at the time this happened, the TSA said, we will turn Texas into a no-fly zone if you pass this anti-groping bill. The bill passed unanimously in the Texas House, and then it was stopped in the Texas Senate by the Lieutenant Governor Dewhurst, who used to work for the CIA. That is what this is, folks. It is nothing but a security sham, and they are shutting down our travel in order to assert their authority. And it's only going to get worse when they move to the roads. Stay with us when we come back. Jakari Jackson is going to be talking to Alejandra Gutierrez about her experiences this week. We celebrate the 4th of July as a reminder of earning our independence from a tyrannical and oppressive government. Just a reminder to the Obama administration, there's plenty of room on the calendar for another holiday. Jakari Jackson here in the Infowars.com studio. I'm joined by our associate producer, the Alex Jones Show, Ale. Now, if you've been on a plane since 9-11, you've had to experience the TSA. And there are many things we can say about the TSA, from the articles about the uh, supervisors stealing iPads to the targeting of attractive women by the TSA agents for groping. And now we see the reports of the very long lines that are happening at these facilities, in particular, Chicago. And Ali was recently in Chicago, and she wants to share her experience so basically, uh, you went out to catch a flight this weekend and just tell us what happened. Well, I was there uh, uh, to meet up with my family for the weekend and on my way back, I show up an hour early to get my 8 p.m. flight and I notice immense lines going from one side to the airport to the other and just circling around and around and around and I immediately knew I was not going to make my flight and I asked some TSA people, hey, my flight's in about like 20 minutes, can I skip the line? And they all just seemed kind of uh, casual and just uh, nonchalant about the fact that I had to make my flight. They didn't care. And that is what bothered me the most because these people were just trying to get home or uh, trying to go to their conventions or, or work and stuff. And the TSA just seemed to not care about the four hour wait that you had to make before even stepping inside the airport. And, and the crew here, we travel quite a bit. I've endured many TSA lines. And I do agree, uh, it's, it's a very nonchalant attitude because basically they're there for you know eight hours or whatever the day is. And if you miss your flight, there's really no skin off their nose. You, know, mm -hmm. you have to go handle that with the individual airlines so they don't have a lot of skin in that game. And I think many people can relate to this. Now, in particular, we've seen uh, videos of the most recent thing that happened this past weekend. We've seen images of people sleeping on cots. Yeah. It was so bad out there. So uh, just from your personal experience, how did this impact you? And was this something that you would expect to happen? I was definitely not expecting this to happen because I'm just, I was just flying domestically. So, you know, usually you're there an hour before and you'll have 30 minutes and everything. But this time, I was just so impressed, and a lot of people were mad. And you can tell. The mm -hmm. energy in the room was just horrible, and people were just uh, trying to get to where they needed to go. And it affected me because, obviously, I have work today, and I had to be here. And the next flight to Austin was today in the morning. So I'm actually, like, coming straight from the airport after waiting an hour and a half at the airport TSA line. But I arrived at 3 in the morning just to make it at 7 a.m. If not, I would have probably not made it. Again. So when you went back to the airport, it was still a long line. Yes. At, at TSA opened back at 3.30. I got there at 4. So not even 30 minutes, and there was already like an hour line. 
It is ridiculous. Yeah. And we've seen many things come out of the TSA. They're saying that they're having some labor disputes, uh, financial disputes. They're saying that they need more money again. It seems like every couple of years they come up with a new scheme to say that we need more money. Uh, we need more money for the scanners or for the agents. And uh, there's speculation that maybe a labor dispute, a financial dispute, had something to do with these long lines in Chicago. Yeah, I believe so because I asked and uh, when I went to rebook my flight, I asked what what was the cause of these long lines and they, they told me that they were having like a, a strike, but it wasn't like an official big strike. They were just doing it in order to, I guess, get some media buzz because at three in the morning, there was news reporters there interviewing people. I kind of, you know, didn't want to be in front of a camera at four in the morning. I was like, I'm just going to wait until later. <laughs> but it was... Uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. You could see I, I took some videos and pictures of the long lines, and every person I talked to was like, I waited two hours in line, and I missed my flight. I waited three hours, and I missed my flight. Everybody was missing their flight. So I'm 100% sure that airlines suffered in some way, and they're just trying to get more money because you saw their attitudes of like laughing and not caring that people were waiting for four hours and mm -hmm. it, it it also kind of made a lot of people angry and that creates a lot of chaos and it, that's what they want they want people to like um go and complain and they're and, trying to make a scene basically exactly without and they and the the thing that bothered me the most as well as i researched it and they said that it's the people's fault for not being ready to go through the lines and that made me so mad because I'm always super ready. I'm always like passport in hand and I'm ready. Take off my shoes and they blame us for well, their it's lack always, of... <laughs> it's always some excuse. Like I said, you know, we travel quite a bit and mainly my experience is when I go to the TSA line, you know, that you have people who are, I guess, trained by now, your frequent flyers or people who have flown enough. Uh, they pull out the laptops, they take the shoes off, they take the belt off. You know, every now and then a guy may forget to take off his belt, but that's not a huge burden of time to rip off your belt. So the fact that they would blame you, the individual, or the uh, passengers in general, I think is quite ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, we have some videos here that I want to show our viewers of just various experience that uh, us and the crew have had going through these TSA lines. I did you guys a favor by letting you go through the door. Now you're doing this? I do this all the time, yes. We have to do it because he opts Well, out. I have to do this to protect my rights. Yeah, but we're not offending him, right? Uh, I offended. find this whole process offensive. Well, yes, you, I find you, it offensive in America to be considered a terrorist and have to prove my innocence. So I'm going to keep doing this. I have a right to do yeah, this. Okay. If you look at the TSA, it says I have a right to do yeah. this. If he agrees, have his face up there because we've been slandered no. a lot when we've done our job and we've done the thing. You know what? There's nothing about him agreeing yeah. to doing his yeah. job. It, police and TSA, we're allowed to film. It's our right yeah. to do that. You are servants of the people. Yeah. You are not separate to the people. We have a right to film you. We will continue to film you. Yeah. There are cameras everywhere. I know. Everybody's being... Everywhere. Yeah. So we, these are our cameras. Okay. These are the people's cameras. Yeah. You got a problem with that? No, I'm not. Okay. I just told you I did you a favor. I understand. <laughs> okay. I understand you think you did us a favor. I appreciate it. Thank you. Right. Thank you. And that is just some of what we've had to endure as individuals. We've seen many other people go through these lines. And this is just a matter of time that we're talking about here today, but we've seen videos of, I believe it was Miss America or, or one of those type people. Uh, she went through the line. She said she was basically molested by the agent there, uh, that they touched her you know, private parts when she went through. And she was basically told to you know, toughen up. This is what we have to do for America. And I think that Al-Qaeda, ISIS, whoever, our foreign enemies are, are laughing at us when they see these type of videos that we have to subject ourselves because we were told back in 9-11 that these people hate us for our freedoms. I don't see too much freedom when you go to the TSA line. You have to get patted down. You have to go through the x-ray scanner and have people search through your back. Yeah, I, I, I've seen videos of like kids getting patted down too and they're like not even wearing, you know, a backpack or anything that you might be able to hide things in or I don't know. But another thing I found interesting is, you know, there's those pre-TSA lines, mm -hmm. those were also like super long. So what's the point in like getting the pre-check the pre uh, pre when it's the same length and they do the same types of scan? It's just, it's ridiculous. The, their whole system is just 
unnecessary, especially for someone like me. I live in Mexico. I travel back and forth all the time. Right. Like my family's in Mexico, so I go and visit them or I travel. I like traveling. So I've done the airport thing countless of times. And every time I feel like I'm a terrorist, every time they question me with, um, what are you doing? What, where, where are you work? Uh, why are you going? What, what address? And every all this stuff. And I'm just like, I'm. I, like, I live here. Yeah, I, I'm like, why don't you do this for the people actually coming yeah. in here and doing the bad stuff? Exactly, and I've like actually even uh, met up with the same people that have like I've made conversation with the same people like a couple times, and it's like I've you you know me, me I've gone through here a couple times, like I've talked well, to you, but you, you they just forget. Come a face in the crowd at exactly. that point. I just want people to think about this as we move forward towards the summer months. There's gonna be a lot of travel going on. And it's not just TSA at the airports, there's also TSA, they're going to train stations, bus stations. Uh, when Josh and I went up to uh, New Jersey for the Super Bowl, there's TSA at the train stations, checking people down, uh, you know, opening your box. What do you have in this box? Like, we didn't have any gear on us at the time. But, I mean, these are the type of things that are starting to spread. And now we see the guys going to, um, to football games or TSA-style security going to the football games, the sporting events. There's even rumors they want to start going to malls and other things. And I just want people to look at these images of Chicago and say, if you put these guys all over the United States of America, whether it's the shopping malls, the sports stadiums, wherever, this is what's going to happen. These guys can have a labor dispute anytime and say, hey, we're going to suspend our operations and this is what you're left with. They're abusing their power for sure. They know that they can uh, make it slower and they're doing it because they can. And to get more money, like we said earlier, it's just they know. And it's not fair for people who just want to get home. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Ale. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> All right, well, that's it for our special report. We thank you for joining us, and we'll see you again right here at the InfoWars Command Center. Anyone wondering why Bernie Sanders' socialist battle cry turned the stomach of many Americans need only look at what is happening in Latin America right now. Reuters reports Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro declared a 60-day state of emergency on Friday due to what he calls plots from within the OPEC country and the United States to topple his leftist government. So decreto, hoy, viernes, 13 de mayo, un estado de excepción y de emergencia económica constitucional para proteger nuestra patria. Aquí está, decreto firmado, aprobado y cúmplase para la protección. Maduro did not provide details of the measure. A previous state of emergency implemented in states near the Colombia border last year suspended constitutional guarantees in those areas except for guarantees relating to human rights. Maduro is panicking after his socialist ally Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff was forced to step down in what she is calling a coup d'etat. It appears Obama is forcing his hand into yet another blatant example of his long list of corporocratic imperialism for the benefit of the New World Order. In 2002, Obama failed to overthrow Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez. As Washington Post Scott Wilson, the paper's Latin America correspondent at the time, reported, the United States was hosting people involved in the coup before it happened. There was involvement of U.S.-sponsored NGOs in training people that were involved in the coup. I think there was U.S. involvement, yes. Maduro has every reason to believe the United States is fomenting his demise. Venezuela is sitting on the largest oil reserves in the world. However, the Venezuelan people are starving, as Zero Hedge reports, hungry Venezuelans are protesting that their children are dying from lack of food and medicine and that they do not have enough water or electricity. As against crony capitalism added, this is a country with more oil than Saudi Arabia and the government has stolen all the money and now they bottleneck peaceful protesters and threaten them with bombs or haul them to prison and torture them. As pure desperation has set in, crime has become inevitable. A man accused of mugging people in the streets of Caracas was surrounded by a mob of onlookers beaten and set on fire. Mob justice is now the supreme arbiter of who lives and who dies. In the coming weeks, Obama will likely install yet another dictator friendly to the United States as he just did in Brazil. Kurt Nimmo writes, the Rothschild-owned magazine The Economist describes Michael Temer as Brazil's unplanned president. The 75-year-old law professor who played a key role in the impeachment of President Dilma Rousseff became the South American country's acting president on Thursday. 
after Rousseff was suspended by the Senate on corruption charges. Temer's rise to power, however, is not merely a happenstance event. It was arranged by the U.S. State Department in much the same way the puppet government was put into place in the Ukraine. On Friday, the whistleblower website WikiLeaks released an unclassified yet sensitive cable revealing Temer acted as an embassy informant for U.S. intelligence and the military. Maduro had supported Obama's approach towards Cuba. However, as the long list of fallen leaders have come to understand with either their own deaths, invasion, or incarceration, the tidal wave of the global recession has benefited Obama, offering him many disguises, but only serves one master's instructions, that of the New World Order. John Bound for Infowars.com. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. It is a big idea, a new world order, a world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. After 1989, President Bush kept said, and it's a phrase that I often use myself, that we needed a new world order. There is a chance for the President of the United States to use this disaster to carry out what his father, a phrase his father used, I think only once and hasn't been used since, and that is a new world order. So that the problem of the Bush presidency will be the emergence of a new international order. Within the next four years, we will see the emergence of a new international the beginning, order. The beginning of a new international order. The pieces are in flux. Soon they will settle again. Before they do, let us reorder this world around us. I think it's task will be to develop an overall strategy for America in this period when really a new world order can be created. It's a great opportunity and it isn't just a crisis. It's about the future of Europe and a new world order. There's a need for a new world order, but it has different characteristics in different parts of the, of the world. But today, with Asia already outproducing Europe, India and China are clearly becoming part of our new order. We are now facing a common challenge. And the challenge is how to build a world order for the first time in history on a global basis. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, a new world is emerging. It is a new world order with significantly different and radically new challenges. The affirmative task we have now is, uh, is to actually um, uh, create uh, uh, a new world order. Good evening, everybody. President Obama and British Prime Minister Gordon today calling for a new world order to tackle our global economic crisis. And the president outlined his vision of a new world order in which the US would participate fully We've got to give them a stake in creating the kind of uh, uh, world order that I think all of us would like to see. So I see a world order in the future with a multipolar uh, world order. I think a new world order is emerging and with it the foundations of a new and progressive era of international cooperation. But in a globalized economy, we are going to have to take global responsibilities and there going to, is going to have to be some semblance of global governance. Never before has a new world order had to be assembled from so many different perceptions or on so global a scale. Nor has any previous order had to combine the attributes of the historic balance of power system with global democratic opinion and the exploding technology of the contemporary period. And I strongly believe India will be a central actor in the new world order. There also exists an extraordinary opportunity to form for the first time in history a truly global society. 2009 is also the first year 
global governance with the establishment of the G20 in the middle of the financial crisis. The climate conference in Copenhagen is another step towards the global management of our planet. New World Order is the headline in the Globe and Mail in Canada. Is this global governance at last? Is it one world, the central bankers in charge? But aren't we all just living and dying for what the central banks do? Of course we are. We are absolutely slaves to central banks. <laughs> I must tell you, the right to defend yourself, the right to keep and bear arms, does not protect your right to shoot deer. It protects your right to shoot at the government when it is taken over by tyrants. These are... The quintessential American right. The right to be left alone. You may or may not be aware that President Obama is seizing millions of acres using executive orders, of course. Of course, there is a process for having national parks. That process runs through Congress. It is a very dangerous thing to give this kind of power to the president. But, of course, many progressives believe that only government can be good stewards of the land. That simply isn't the case. And it should not be the case that our government is allowed to take the land in the manner in which they're taking it. Here's a report that Rob Jacobson and I put together. The Bundy family, at this particular time, sons of Clive and Bundy, who's where he should be. He's, as we speak, he's in jail. Ammon and Ryan Bundy are in jail. They were two of the participants in the unlawful takeover. On April the 7th, 2016, Nevada Senator Harry Reid stood on the Senate floor and continued his bid for the federal government to grab more land than Americans have been using for generations. As usual, Reid uses typical cheap tactics and vague snapshots to pull at the heartstrings of those who are listening without providing facts or substance to back up the claims that he makes. Take, for example, a stunningly beautiful place called Gold Butte where Clive and Bundy illegally grazed his cattle for decades. Because of the trouble caused by the Bundys and their pals, uh, the federal employees tasked with safeguarding these antiquities have been prevented from doing their jobs. But what is at stake? Millions of acres of state-run land and the lives of several patriots, one of whom has already been executed in cold blood. Hey, here. Go ahead, shoot me. Stay down, stay down, stay down, stay down, stay down. Harry Reid says the Red Butte must be saved. And to do it, Reid is urging Obama to use the Antiquities Act of 1906, which gives the president unilateral power to create a national monument with the stroke of his pen. It's a very different process from creating a national park. And that's because it was designed for a different purpose. The Antiquities Act of 1906 was signed into law by President Theodore Roosevelt in 1906. It was intended for the protection of objects of historic and scientific interest, such as Native American land and artifacts. Devil's Tower in Wyoming was America's first national monument, and its boundary enclosed an area of less than two acres. But the Roosevelts, both Teddy and later FDR, continued to set an example by preserving monuments which altogether totaled approximately four and a half million acres. Laws which are inherently unconstitutional are easily expanded and abused. For example, the federal income tax started as only a 1% tax, with 99% of the people paying zero income tax. The Antiquities Act has now likewise metastasized like a cancer, and it's being used by presidents to get around Congress to declare large swaths of land to be federally protected and under the jurisdiction of the Bureau of Land Management. Recently, presidents like Bill Clinton, Jimmy Carter, and Barack Obama have used this act to declare millions of acres of American land as national monuments. Not since the Roosevelts themselves have such unilateral land grabs been declared by the executive branch. Jimmy Carter took a staggering 56 million acres of Alaskan land. This abuse of power resulted in the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act, which requires Congress to authorize the use of the Antiquities Act for over 5,000 acres, but only in Alaska.
Bill Clinton used the act to grab 5.7 million acres. Recently, Barack Obama has used this act to take over 4 million acres in California alone. In other words, it's about the same amount of land that both of the Roosevelts took nationally that Obama took just in the state of California. At the request of Senator Dianne Feinstein, Obama designated the Mojave Trail, the Sands to Snow, and the Castle Mountains as national monuments. Knowledgeable of the Antiquities Act, these politicians deceptively use language to make their actions seem as if they're heroic custodians of the land, while privately twisting the intentions of the bill, abusing their power, expanding it to absurd extremes in order to take federal control of the land and place it under the BLM. Currently, Oregon, Utah, and Nevada are under the threat of having massive amounts of land confiscated by executive action. Currently up for grabs with Obama's pen and his executive abuse of monument protection are Western lands in Oregon, Utah, Nevada, Colorado, Arizona, Idaho, Montana. Over 10 million acres, just counting the biggest grabs. Several of the larger areas are the same size or larger than Yellowstone. And it's not just Western lands that are being locked up. In Maine, a plan to lock up 3.2 million acres, one and a half times the size of Yellowstone. Another plan in Florida to lock up a million acres. Progressives don't trust people who have had stewardship of the land for many generations, whose livelihoods depend on sustainable management and on good stewardship of the land. Progressives don't even trust state government to take care of the land. Progressives believe only the federal government can protect the land. And the only way to protect the land is to lock out humans and to confiscate their property rights. In other words, they will accept nothing less than the United Nations Agenda 21. But how is federal protection with monument status working out for the Apache Indians at Tonto Forest National Monument? This beautiful area in Arizona has great historical, religious, and cultural significance for the Apache Indians and recreational use for everyone else. But the federal government protectors are turning the campgrounds into copper mines. It will turn this into this. The historical monument lands will become a massive crater visible from space two miles across and a thousand feet deep. A 50-story high mountain of waste tailings will be dumped elsewhere in the monument. It's simply monumental fraud. The Indians in Arizona at the Tonto National Monument have learned the federal government cannot be trusted as a protector of the land or Indian history and artifacts. In his book, where white men fear to tread, Russell Means said white men need to understand that just as the federal government has broken every treaty with the Indians, it is breaking every aspect of its treaty with Americans, the Constitution. Harry Reid and the BLM, just two years after telling the Bundys they would be allowed to continue to graze their cattle, are now renewing their claims that cattle grazing endangers the desert tortoise. It'll be interesting to see what happens as more people understand the need to stand up to federal land grabs now than understood two years ago when the standoff occurred. For InfoWars.com, I'm David Knight. And again, the thing that concerns us about this is the executive orders that are being used to seize this property. And what we see happening in Arizona where a monument is being turned over to a foreign corporation. I remember at the very beginning of the Republican primaries, I was very concerned and still am concerned about Donald Trump's use of eminent domain for private use. And yet the conservatives who criticized him on this, like... Ted Cruz advocated that we would have a pipeline, the Keystone Pipeline, that would seize private property, some of it having been in family farms that have been in the family for 150 years, turn that over to a foreign corporation using, guess what, eminent domain. The end line for all this is not just that they don't care about any legal process, that they don't care about private property rights, but at the end game with all of this is Agenda 21. We pointed this out many times, and again, as we've talked about before, we now have a New York Times op-ed piece openly talking about how the idea of 50 states is antiquated, and we need to replace them with regional collectives, okay, and with urban uh, archipelagos, as they put it, even suggesting that they should combine these urban areas, these newly formed urban areas that would replace our states that they should combine them across international lines, that you would take Detroit and Windsor, Canada, for example, and make that one of these urban archipelagos. You understand, of course, that Agenda 21 is the idea that it removes everyone off of the land, the farmers, the miners, the loggers, 
anybody who lives in rural areas would be removed off of those areas. Their property rights, such as mining and grazing and water rights that they've had for generations, would be taken away, and they would be forced into the cities. And now they're openly talking about this plan, comparing it to what the Chinese are doing, saying it's a great idea that the Chinese are forcing people into these urban regional areas, about 26 urban areas that'll have about 100 million people, saying this is a great idea that the conservative prime minister, James Cameron, is doing the same thing in Britain. Who gives them that authority, that they would force us into urban areas? The power is with these property rights that are being taken right now. And the way that they're going to enforce this is going to be with restrictions and control on our movements, not just abrogation of our long-held property rights. That's it for tonight's Nightly News. Join us again tomorrow night at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern for the InfoWars Nightly News.